This week, I couldn't help being drawn to the reading from Isaiah, given the horrifying events that are unfolding in and around Gaza right now. Not just because of the obvious connection that both are about Israel and both are about peoples living in and fighting over the Holy Lands, but for the more universal and deeper connection that both bring to mind central issues and questions of our human existence. How do we make sense of the horrifying violence of our human nature? What can we do with our feelings of helplessness to stop it? Where do we find our hope? These questions arise in relation to war, as most of us this week have witnessed through video images or news stories, sickening atrocities happening to innocent people, young and old, and families. The truth is that it's hard even to take in the hope and meaning that is in our scriptures today when our hearts are traumatized and so heavy and stricken with grief and trauma and despair and nausea in our gut. We want to put these feelings aside, and we do to some degree, so that we can function. But underneath the surface, as human beings, these feelings are in our bodies and our spirits, and they weigh on us. And we need the food of compassion and mercy to strengthen and hold us, to calm the blurring of our vision. And so, uh, before opening the scriptures, I'd like to ask your indulgence in taking a brief moment to be with our heart's critical underlying need for God's mercy and compassion, given what we have witnessed, and that given the reverberation to families around the world, and in fact, to the whole human family around the entire world. So I invite you, if you wish, to literally take a moment to notice if there is tension in your neck or your jaw or your shoulders. Close your eyes if you wish. Notice if there is heaviness in your heart or a sickening feeling in your gut. These signals are a cry for help, messages from the depths of us vibrating in our bodies we want to ignore them. It just feels too unbearable to feel them and often inconvenient. But here, in this house of God, perhaps you will choose to bear them just even for a few moments. The compassion of God is here like an invisible mist, present in this holy space in which we sit. And I invite you to breathe it in slowly and let that compassion permeate whatever you may be noticing in your body, in your heart. The compassion that is literally here is in Christ who dwells in this space where thousands of brothers and sisters have gathered for 95 years to pray and worship and call on God's graces. God's compassion is in the hearts of all who are here right now. And you may choose to breathe softly and slowly and say yes to what is here. God so wants to console us. Breathe in also knowing that billions of people all over the earth right now are feeling compassion and concern and heartache for the suffering. Breathe in God's compassion in the form of solidarity. Breathe in the compassion out of love for those around you and in your life. Breathe in from your desire to be grounded in compassion for all. And also exhale slowly with the intention to release to God whatever you don't need to be holding right now. Friends, in traumatic times, we need to take exquisite care of ourselves and one another and to let God take care of us 
in intentional ways, such as we just did, receiving nourishment. There are many places of hope and meaning in the beautiful scriptures we heard today, more than I can name in my time standing up here. One place is in the assurance given in Isaiah about a holy banquet. The oracle speaking in these verses says, the Lord will make for all peoples a feast of rich food and wines and will destroy the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. The Lord will swallow up death forever and will wipe away the tears of all faces, and the Lord will take away the disgrace of people all over the earth. The style of writing in this chapter of Isaiah is considered to be apocalyptic scripture. Now today, many people relate to apocalyptic writing as all about the end times, which is a common theme of apocalyptic scripture, but it's much, much more to that. It's a very particular, complex, often mind-bending and mystical form of scriptural writing that conveys deep and wide wisdom. And one quality of it is that it often urges people, as in the lines I just read from Isaiah, to trust that all things in the end will be set right by God, beyond our understanding. The word apocalyptic comes from the Greek word revelation, meaning unveiling things that are not known, unveiling things that we cannot see without revelation. And so, says this passage in Isaiah, a feast of rich food with wine. Does that sound familiar? This connection speaks to another significant aspect of apocalyptic scripture in that it continues out of the Jewish tradition and into Christianity. Is there is apocalyptic scripture in both testaments. In the New Testament, such as in Revelation or the story of the sheep and the goats, the, this forms a, a crucial bridge between the testaments, and understanding this helps us to see our scripture with more clarity and depth. Apocalyptic scripture has been called an intellectual matrix of early Christian meaning-making. A German Luther, Lutheran theologian named Ernst Casimir called apocalyptic scripture the mother of Christian theology. And so, a feast. Also the topic of the parable Jesus told in our scriptures today, the third of three parables in a row, in fact, that emphasize in dramatic language the immense consequences of our choices, our choices to become what the gift of our creation gives us to be or not. What can we do in our sense of helplessness to the horrific atrocities in war? We can turn toward this fullness of being that God is offering to us and open to ourselves as creatures in the image of the divine. In the parable today, a man is thrown out of a wedding feast because he wasn't wearing the correct wedding robe. Now, isn't that a little bit elitist and superficial? No, maybe not. What could be meant by this wedding robe? We are invited to put on the robe of Christ in every layer of our being, to put on the robe of truth the clarity and reality of our being in God. And in doing so, we can more truly see and receive the nourishment of the feast that is being offered to us, and we can become what we receive. Paul put it best when he said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We can become that in the world even as we witness the excruciating specter of war and violence and destruction. 
Our faithful old psalm today told us the promise, though I walk through the shadow of death, you are with me, you restore my soul, you comfort me. Not just poetic words, but the reality. We cannot grasp these truths with our minds alone. Our minds are not nearly vast enough to take it in and to contain all the truth that is. But revelation and comfort can come to us through our hearts and spirits when we choose to put on Christ in our being in ways such as acknowledging the vulnerability of what we feel right now and asking for God's help and taking in compassion and mercy. Our epistle exhorted us in other ways to put on Christ. Know that the Lord is near, be in prayer, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. The process of putting on Christ to arrive fully at the feast and be fed is not easy. It requires everything of us, but it offers us the chance to inhabit the greatest gifts of life. And this is the Holy Land. What can we offer to this suffering world but to be transformed by God? Because as we are transformed, the world is transformed. We are capable of being vessels of compassion and mercy, beacons of light, and carriers of the grace that is not ours, but which we can share by, through God into the world. This is the one thing we have control over, and the one thing that we can give to the world, and it matters. May we come to the feast humbled and open, and become what we receive.